So we've been setting ourselves up to start our development. Uh, the big idea is that we need to set up our software uh, environment, our development environment. Once that is set up, uh, then we're going to bring in the project from last month into this month. That project from last month is, in, is a web project. And we saw in Visual Studio that a web project is, is inside of this solution. So we cannot simply just drag and drop uh, our code from last month into this project. Not exactly. We have various things to worry about. So what we're going to do first, though, is set up a starting point for our project. We, we're going to get back to CBDB, the project from last month. We need to set up the groundwork for that. We've got enough knowledge so far about what is Visual Studio, you know, what do you do with it, plugging in devices and such. So I'm going to go back to Visual Studio. And we'll go to File, Close Solution. This testing project that we're playing with, it, it's of no consequence. You don't have to save it or keep it. Just go to File, Close Solution. File, New Project. I'm going to create a new project, which is going to be our real project that we're going to work with uh, throughout the, the, the course of this month. File new project. Uh, main thing to do here before you forget location, your flash drive. So uh, on my flash drive, I've got my various you know folders for organization. What I'm going to say is I'm going to recommend for you to save your project just on the root level of your flash drive, not in a subfolder, because I've noticed in previous semesters. I've got, let's say, a, a folder for this class, and in there I make a folder called My App. I've noticed in previous semesters that when people save their project in a subfolder of a subfolder, there are then problems later on. There is a maximum character limit in our version of Windows, which is Windows 7, of 256 characters. File names can be a maximum of 256 characters in Windows 7. File names include also your folder path. So if you've got a folder plus a subfolder plus a subfolder, and then I've got CVDV, all of that is adding up to be a long path name. And I've seen this with people when they try to copy the files and such. It says file name is too long, and it just won't copy. So this project that we're about to save, we're going to save it to the root level of your flash drive you know something very simple CBDB and then you know the date or something so what I would recommend here this project now go off and browse and go to your flash drive you have to find your flash drive Mine is drive F. So just select the top level of your flash drive. Don't select anything else. Just select the flash drive, select folder. So this is going to get saved to my F drive, my flash drive. It will automatically create a folder below that. That's fine, based on what name you give it here. The name of our project, CBDB. You can spell it uppercase, lowercase, doesn't matter. This is going to create a CBDB folder on my F drive so that we can continue with our project. I'll click OK. Ideally, your project is saved on the hard drive of your computer because it's going to be a little slower to work off of your flash drive. I don't believe these systems have USB 3 plugs. And even if you had a USB 3.0 USB drive, right, it has to slow down to USB 2 speeds. So ideally, this project, you're running it on, on, on a regular hard drive on the computer, actually an SSD drive, even better. So just be aware that now that we're going to run our project off of our flash drive, it's going to be also now a little bit slower, too. And um, sometimes what we, the, our development process is just waiting. 
letting it compile or letting it copy in, that's normal. So our, um, our project that we've saved here um, on our flash drive, you will, you will see here also um, the Solution Explorer. Here are the pieces of our project. I want to go in and change some of the basic aspects of the project, the developer name and all of that. Anyone remember how to do that? Where do I go change the basic guts of our app? Yep, config XML right here. So go ahead and open up config.xml, our configuration file. We need to change nothing in tool set. You go over to common. Okay, so that's the display name. That's what's going to display right below your icon. You can keep it as is like that, or you can, you know, put it all caps or whatever, or be fancy like, like we did last time. Capital D, or how did we do it? Like that? I forgot, but we can change that whenever. CVDB. Start page, of course, will be the index. Default locale is English, of course. Package name. This is the part where do not type exactly what I type. Think about it. You need to have your own unique identifier here. You don't have to have a real website. But just to keep it easy, com dot your last name. Dot the name of the project, CVDB. So make sure your last name is there, not mine or this one I'm making up. Because um, when we get to the point eventually of the class where you upload this to the App Store, yours will be rejected because mine will be there first and you two apps in the App Store cannot have the same package name. A million apps on the App Store can be called CBDB but what differentiates them all is this package name. So make sure it's your last name. And if you do have a real website, you know, if I do have victor.com for real in the real world, it's got to be in the order, the extension, and then the first part, and then dot the name of your app. This is just the way it is. This is the syntax of it. CDDB. Lowercase, yes. What if you have a common last name? Have... Like Smith? Yeah. <laughs> you get an automatic F? <laughs> no. Um, right there. CBDB2. Just anything that's different than what, uh, than what is already uploaded to the App Store. So, um, yeah, I'll keep it on Smith. This won't matter until we publish in part three, so it can be this until a certain point. Version, you can decide whatever you want to put there. I'm going to recommend, like I said last time, 1.1. Today's date, which is 3.8. <clears throat> and I like to do it as the year, then the month, then the day. The other ones here, of course, um, we've already talked about these. These are obvious. You put in your name or your company name, your development company name. So I'm going to go with Smith Apps LLC. Sure. Again, you do not type that because you're not, your company is not Smith Apps. You put whatever you want there, your real name, your your company name and you don't have to go off and register in City Hall or anything like that. You just put whatever you want there and you're a developer. Later on in part three we will talk about getting a developer certificate which is which is free uh, to publish to the App Store and we'll get to that in part three. Description, a, a very quick one sentence or so description of our project. Uh, so put whatever you want here in one sentence. Can you describe what CBDB is? track and view your comic collection comic book collection all of this can be changed whenever you want it doesn't have to be right right now 
but I'll start it like that. Um, for our CBDB project, I'm going to recommend and I'm going to set mine to portrait orientation. I want my CBDB project to be locked vertically. Um, it's fine if you leave it either or. You know, if you want it to rotate sideways to show you more, that's fine. But I'm going to put, uh, I'm going to do mine as portrait. These other items don't matter. Save the file for the moment. Plugins, we'll be adding plugins as we need them, so we won't add any just yet. Um, actually, we'll add one more. Uh, on plugins, let's activate the, the better console. Um, this is a console similar to the um, Firefox or Google Chrome console viewer, but it's one that um, gives us a few more features when debugging Android. So under Plugins, Core Plugins, find Console and Edit. <coughs> uh, you might see a warning, don't worry about that. But it's installed, got the little green check mark. You can save the file. Um, for we're not we're not targeting Windows or iOS just yet, so I'm not going to write any settings here just yet. We're going to focus on Android at the moment. So all of these items here to fill in. Um, these are I'm going to give you another handout in a moment that explains this stuff a little bit more. Uh, but version code here. Uh, th this has to be a sequential whole number, such as 1 or you know, 4 or whatever. What this is, is every time we upload our code to the App Store, it's technically a different version of the code. So even though over here on the common, I have this is version 1.1 dot whatever, when we upload it to the App Store, to the Android App Store, it's going to be version 1. Then the next version we upload, you know, I change it later, 1.2 and then the date. The next version is simply going to be 2. So these are just going to increment in whole numbers every time we upload it to the App Store. These can be anything technically. You can do 100, and then the next time you upload it to the App Store, it's 101. Uh, 109 if you want. It doesn't matter. Short answer, this is just every different version of your code that is uploaded to the App Store. You start with one. Which minimum version of Android are we supporting? Which maximum version are we supporting? And uh, what's like our ideal target of Android? Uh, anyone know what's the latest version of Android? Ah, you, you cheated. I wanted you to say 7. That's what most people will see it as, 7. But yes, API 27, behind the scenes, yes. So Android uh, has different version uh, numbers, API number, and code name. So uh, Android, the current one I believe is Oreo. Is that the current one? Oreo? Android Oreo. Um, that's the latest version of it. Uh, so Android version code names are based on on treats, based on uh, cook, uh, you know cupcakes and all of that. It's Oreo, uh, Eclair, uh, cupcake, uh, Kit Kat, etc. There's a bunch of them, and it's alphabetical. It's you know no one cares about that except if you're a nerd programmer. So don't worry about that. But these different versions of the Android um, are also delineated by a whole number, like version 7. And like I said, you needed version 4.0 at least. Um, well, behind the scenes, they're also under API levels, which are sequential, version 1, 2, 3, etc. And the current one is 26, 27, somewhere there. Uh, we can look that up back on developer.android.com. 
uh, short answer here. We're going to be covering at least Android version API 14, which is 4.0, I believe, uh, covering up to the um, newest version, which um, I have to look up it exactly, but I guess it's 27. Uh, and um, the version that we're going to target is any version in between that. If we say, well, I, I want to go with 27, that might exclude a variety of devices. I've got this one that is Android you know, 14, but it says we're targeting 27, so my app won't work on some devices. So it's a little bit better to err on the side of caution going lower. At the minimum, we'll accept them Android 14, and at the maximum, 27. And we're fine if our code targets the lowest one, because then it's the most compatible. If we try to target a higher version, the older ones might not be compatible, and you're excluding a population. There's no easy answer for me to say what to do here. If you want an answer, I'm going to put 14, 27, 14. But there's no easy answer because depending on what your app is and what it does and its features and its plugins and all of that stuff, you may say, well, my version minimum, a person has to have at least 20 and will support the latest one, and we want to target 20. So it's going to depend on various factors. I'll just keep it like this. Keep it running in the background, yes. Launch mode, single. Show title, no. And in-app storage, in-app browser storage. So this is, uh, this is our local storage stuff. Obviously, we do not want to turn this off, or local storage will no longer work. Our login system we made last month won't work anymore. The default is on, so keep it on. Let, uh, let the app store stuff in the, in the simulated browser area of the, of the device. Save this screen. And you can close the config XML file. If you have this overview screen, I'm also going to close that. And if you have a real device plugged in, go ahead and run it on the device. What I want to see is um, after you run it on the real device, uh, you know, exit the app and go over to view all your apps. You should see it there with the Cordova mascot icon and it should say CBDB. The old version with the old name will still be there and like I said you can delete apps by dragging and dropping them to the trash can. So you just go ahead and run that just to make sure it runs on the device. <clears throat> it's good practice when making changes to save it and run it, check your code. And depending on the changes you make, uh, you might select a real device or a virtual device. So because I haven't run this project yet this first time, it takes a moment. And again, it's running off my flash drive, and it's not USB 3.0, so it's going to be a little... A little slower. So when you um, when you start the lab day, you're going to set yourself up. So there, finally, um, it loads up. Looks exactly the same as these other blank projects we've worked on. Um, uh, that's to be expected. But now, uh, when I try to rotate it, I'm, mine's not going to rotate. Uh, I'm also going to then uh, stop the simulation. Then I'm going to go over to my app screen, and I'm going to look, and I see CVDB right there. 
Now what you can also do is if you tap and hold it, you often have App Info. If you drag the app to App Info, it'll give you an info screen, in my case, version 1.1.201803. And it's taking up, at the moment, uh, 756 kilobytes. So three quarters of one megabyte on the device. So you can tap and hold the app and then check the uh, app info. So I've got the project loading up in the device. Now the icon is um, the icon is the built-in Cordova mascot icon thing. For just for some quick fun, let's do something here. We can change this icon. We're going to have a whole lesson where we'll, where we'll talk about graphics and stuff. But for the moment, just for fun, I want to change this little mascot icon that it that it comes with. Um, go to your go outside of Visual Studio. Go to your flash drive and go to where your project is. So go to your flash drive, go to your CBDB folder. Then inside of um, inside of the CBDB folder you see you see the Visual Studio solution file. Then you see the folder CBDB project, open that one. There's build JSON, or uh, not build, uh, there's uh, config XML, there's the WW folder. Remember last time we saw in the res folder resources, this is where we saw the, the built-in icon and splash screen. Uh, go ahead and open res. Thank you. Let's go to icons. Then Android. Um, we've got the three icon, uh, the four icons. Right click. Right click the first one. And select Edit. If you did a double click, that's fine. It'll open up in Fireworks, which is like Photoshop, but worse. So if you right click, um, and then select Edit. It should open up in just plain old paint. And what we can do here is just play with it. I'm not going to do anything special. I'm just going to draw on it and give him evil eyes. Just go in and change those little four icons. Just change them somehow. Draw on them or put some text or give it a mouth or something. For each one of those four, just for fun, we're going to do real icons eventually. But take a moment to change each of those four icons. You want to right click and edit each one. Change them somehow. Then run your project in Visual Studio again. And then go see your icon. Go, go see to where your app's installed. And go see your changed icon. Change each icon a little bit different. The purpose of changing each one differently is this, this is how you can then identify which icon your device loads up. In the 36 one, maybe I'll give it red eyes. And then in the 48 one, I'll give it blue eyes and different color eyes on each one. So then when I go look on my device and I see the yellow eyes, well, I know that it's then icon 48, just so that you can identify your particular sort of device's features. So uh, again, we'll have a lesson later on where we do real graphics. But for the moment, just change it, click Save at the top, and then do that for the other ones. You can zoom in on the bottom right corner to see the details. <coughs>
after you make those changes, go back to Visual Studio and then run your project again to see the result. Try that out for a moment to uh, make some fun little graphics changes and then see it if you can see it on the device.
Okay, so uh, let's let's do uh, let's move on here. Uh, continuing to set up our basic CBDB project. If you go back to Visual Studio, I'm going to stop my simulation. If yours is still running, uh, if you go back to Visual Studio, um, and you open the WW folder. As I said, we're going to spend most of our time uh, doing changes in this folder. There's our index file, JavaScript, CSS, and images. I gave you a handout last time, number three. Handout number three, the WW folder. We did a quick overview of it, and now we will use this more for real. So go back to your handout number three. Let's take a quick look at here. Um, I break down line by line the different things that our starting point project is. Uh, we are going to need to change a few starting point items so that it can be a shell for us to import our project later. So looking at this, if you, if you manage to print it out, good. If not, you can switch back and forth the screens. I'll turn the printer on later. But we'll look at this in detail. So line 8 in Visual Studio, you want to open your index.html. Content security policy. This is a way to uh, make our app secure in terms of what can it access, what can it use, or not. And the default that is here makes the app pretty secure. It's saying it can access certain things and not other things. By default, we can access things that are in the data protocol, the gap protocol, and things over at gstatic.com, which is a Google server. Style sheets. Um, right here it says style source. The syntax of this is very weird compared to other syntax because it's it's basically here is the property and then the values. And usually when we deal with CSS, for example, there's a property, a colon, and then a value. Well, we're saying by default these are the properties we can access the value self, data, gap, and that website. Then there's a semicolon, and then another declaration. Here's the style sheets that we can access, safe or self and unsafe inline. So we can, we can access style sheets or CSS code that is in this self file, up in the head, for example. And we can use inline CSS, which is generally unsafe. So the next one is media regarding 
like graphics and such. So this says anything. The asterisk is a wild card. It means anything. You can put any kinds of graphics. So there is a, uh, there is a link here um, that you should follow at some point to understand fully what this is about. The defaults are fine. But you know, it's saying here, add unsafe inline to default source to enable inline JavaScript which we don't. We, we want JavaScript in its own JavaScript file, so we don't need to do this. If we wanted to add JavaScript inline to an element, we have to first say, okay, we're going to use unsafe inline JavaScript code, which we're not. <clears throat> but this, this simple line here, seemingly simple, can be very complex in terms of what makes your, how it makes your app secure or not. We need to talk about security on a deeper level another day because that's on our minds a lot. Uh, another website got hacked, or this app got hacked, or credit cards got stolen, and all of that. So we have to talk about security, cybersecurity, a little later. We've got a few lines over here, 11 and 12. Extra meta tags regarding format detection and how to make this behave more like a real app. Because technically, this is a web project. And we have to kind of massage it into place for it to, for the person to use it as a real app. There is going to be a protocol of telephone um, that was going to be the standard for mobile devices. It didn't work out that way. So this is basically saying don't use that old archaic standard for this project. So it says telephone no. And it has MS application tap highlight. No. Well, our project, as I've said before, can work on Android devices, iPhone devices, Windows devices. So on a website, you can tap and hold to select the text, right? You're browsing a website, you tap and hold, you select text. You can't do that on a regular app. You can't use most apps, and you tap and hold, and you select the word there, like their logo or something. That's what's saying here. If this is on an MS or Microsoft device, basically, don't allow the tap highlighting to happen. Don't break the illusion that this is a real project on a real app. We've got this viewport, which is a little bit different than what we looked at before. It has a few extra things, such as minimum scale and maximum scale. So yet a few more meta tags here to lock it into looking great on any size device. Line 14 points over to our CSS file. Uh, so that's where we're going to write our custom code of CSS eventually. There's the title of our project, which when it's in a real app will never show up. There is no title that will show up on a real app. That's, you can leave it as is or just put it, you know, the same spelling as we've had before. We have this div that we do not need at all. The default template is sort of just like, look at this, it works. But it's not anything that we want. We, we don't really need this to say connecting to device and device is ready. That's just to show you it works. So all of that is in this div. We don't need any of that. Go ahead and delete it. You can comment it out if you want, but I'm going to delete it. And instead, I'm going to write cvdb. So what we're doing here is what's in the handout, explaining these various <coughs> lines. Lines 18 to 24 can be removed completely. This is used to display the device ready message. Not necessary, we're going to do something better. Line 25, this is the magic. This is the library that converts our HTML, CSS, and JavaScript into the appropriate language per platform. This cordova.js file must be here in order for our projects to work. If you have a keen eye, you will notice it's not listed anywhere in the WW folder. That's normal. It dynamically is generated every time you build. So you will not see Cordova.js 
in the WW folder. It's somewhere else. And then they put it into WW when you compile. That's normal if you don't see it. We do see these two other files in the scripts folder, platform overrides, and then index.js. Platform overrides JS is a way for us to write JavaScript code per platform. Maybe we are going to use Cordova code that works in Android but doesn't work in iOS. Remember when we looked at vibration? It said this code works on Android and iOS and everything, normal vibrate. And this one said vibrate with pattern only works in Android. So we can have it that, depending on the platform, certain code will work. So that file is in there. We don't have to do anything with it at the moment. But we, would write platform, we would write code per platform, which would then work per platform. We have a way, um, using also merges over here later, we have a way to write code of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript that will only work on certain platforms. For the moment, to keep it easy, we'll use the same code universal for all the platforms. But we have a way to have platform-specific code. And then we've got the basic index.js uh, file where we're going to have our JavaScript. So when we integrate the project from last month, we have a place for everything and everything in its place. The HTML file from last month, we're going to put it into this HTML file, basically. Any CSS code we wrote last month, we're going to put it into this CSS file. And all of that JavaScript we've written last month, we're going to put it into that JavaScript file. So this starting point from Visual Studio will serve as that template. I'm going to save that index file and let's go to our CSS file. CSS folder, index CSS. We're going to remove most of this stuff here because this is just for the basic. Um, this is just for the basic uh, uh, device ready. Uh, WebKit tap highlight color RGBA0000. So, WebKit, which is Google Chrome, <coughs> which is Google devices, Android devices. Here's the example again that your app might load up, your web project might load up in an app, and a person can tap and hold it and select text. Well, here we're deactivating that feature uh, in in Android devices, the highlight color is set to black transparent. So it won't look like you're highlighting anything. We've got a variation of it over here. Touch callout, touch text size, etc. User select none. Don't let the user select text like a real app. And we've got the various colors that we put in the background. Well, we don't want any of that stuff because we've got our theme roller version of jQuery mobile colors. Right? When you were tested last month on adding the <coughs> colors to your project, those colors are better than these, which is just gray and dark gray and, and black. So all of the lines here basically from 9 all the way to we'll do 28. We don't need those colors. We don't need this font. We don't need these sizes. These, these will all conflict, actually. Text transform that's making the text uppercase. I don't want that. So that selects lines 9 to 28 and delete all of that. Line to 9 to 28. The ones I left, which we could remove also, but um, we've got this back, this basic background color. Uh, we can leave that for the moment. Um, 
anything that might be transparent in our project we would see that color and then the particular font um, we'll be able to choose our own fonts of course but for the moment uh, this is use Roboto regular font uh, comma or Droid Sans comma or Sego UI comma or Sego comma or San Francisco this is depending on the device Roboto Regular and Android Sans are the built-in Android fonts. So when your project loads up on an Android device, it's going to load it's going to try to load the default Android fonts, which should be installed and should look fine. Next, these are the basic Windows device fonts. So if your app loads on a Windows device, it won't find these, so it'll skip them and go here. If you load it on an iPhone, it'll skip these and go to the iPhone or iPad fonts. And later on, we'll see how to add other better fonts. Font size, that can be tweaked. And we have this class of app. Well, we deleted in the index file that div. And that div said div class equals app. There's the definition, and that's where that picture shows up. And its position and all of that. So we don't need this at all. We don't have we don't have a class with that div anymore. So delete lines 15 to 25. <clears throat> delete that selector of app. This um, at media, this is what's detecting if it's portrait or landscape. If it's, um, the default is portrait. If it's landscape, this kicks in. But again, uh, this is listing a div with that graphic, which no longer exists. So inside the media query, go ahead and delete app. You can leave the the curly brace, uh, which started here, and delete that. It may still be redundant, however, because as I said, my project in Config XML, I've locked it to portrait. I'm never going to be able to see it landscape because Config XML supersedes it. So if you want to do a version of the project that is portrait or landscape, you have the ability right here to change your CSS on a case-by-case -case basis, portrait or landscape. On mine, I'm not going to have landscape at all, so for me it's redundant, but you can keep it if you want, and it might be a good idea to add a note here, CSS code to detect landscape view. So then if you want to change your styling when it's in landscape mode, you put your code between those brackets. Everything else that follows that you don't need because here is a definition for the H1 which our project from last month is better here is a class of event and a listener and a received and a glowing color we don't need any of that we deleted all of that so basically after this media query delete everything after that too file to uh, to work with the um, 
the JavaScript file. index.js and my handout scripts so explaining the various lines line 8 very important in order for Cordova to work we need to detect that the device it's running on is ready if the device ready event occurs we then run on device ready function without this line we cannot use any Cordova JavaScript code so the code here, there's a little bedtime reading right there. Then we've got the immediately invoked function expression. Use strict mode. <clears throat> Document.add event listener, device ready. Uh, we had a version before. Document.add or we had uh, you know uh, my button dot add event listener click waiting for a click on the button do something here it's saying in this device in this document wait for the event device ready that cordova.js file when it loads into the memory of the device it will emit an event device ready when cordova code loads up that cordova.js file device ready will be emitted this will capture it it will run the it will run the function on device ready so then we're ready to write code and use code of, of Cordova. So this line here, do not edit line 8, which then leads us over to line 10, which is our definition of on device ready. What I want to do at the end of that line, because this is going to get a really long file, I want to put end on device ready. Just like we were doing last month, we were marking where the ends of our functions were. Because this is going to get pushed down, and this is the one that's going to. This is the file that's going to have like 700 lines. You're going to lose track of that curly brace. So I would like to put that there to remind you. So inside of on device ready, when the Cordova JS file has loaded into memory, so basically this is it. When the Cordova JS file loads into memory, now we can use Cordova code. So all the Cordova code must be written inside of on device ready. And what's already here is document.add event listener pause and event listener resume. Handle the Cordova pause and resume events. So thanks to Cordova, we can detect when the app is running, when the app, when the app is the main app running, and we exit it, the pause event fired or emitted. The pause event was emitted. That then captures it. Oh, we paused. So run a function called on pause and do something when the app is paused. Like maybe save data in the application. When I return back to the project, it emitted the resume event. That line 13 captures it and then <coughs> runs on resume and other stuff happens. So just for fun and for testing, in the on pause, let's write some console output saying we returned to the or we uh, we exited the app. And inside of on resume, let's console we returned to the app. Now here again, I'm starting to type C-O-N-S. You can then press tab. It'll type it for you. Then start typing dot L-O tab. It finishes it for you. Start typing. And then it pops up as hints about inside of this. There's usually a message. So uh, visuals. Visual Studio here will give us a lot of pop-ups. And then if I start my double quote, it'll automatically end my double quote. We returned to the app. And then end the line, semicolon. We have other we have other events that we'll capture as well. One of them is back button. The back button of the device. At the moment, if I press back, it'll it'll go back. I I don't want that. So later, 
we're going to capture the back event and prevent it from going back. And the reason for that is I want to be in the app and I want to press the buttons in the app to navigate in the app. I don't want to press back because what could happen, remember, after you log in, technically, you can press back and it takes you back to the login screen without logging out. So eventually we'll capture the back button and disable it. And anyway, there, aren't, there is no back button in on, on an iPhone, for example. So uh, we, have, we want the navigation to happen within the app, not outside of the app. These other items here. To do, Cordova has been loaded. Perform any initialization. Well, here we're creating an object parent element. Document.get element by ID. Device ready. We don't have any ID in the HTML file anymore. Device ready. We don't have any class of listening or received in the index file anymore. And therefore, we can no longer set the attribute to to glowing anymore. So all of these items, line 16 to 20, we don't need. Those were a remnant of what we had on the old index template file. I want to replace that with console log. App is ready. Perhaps more, more um, more correct, Cordova is ready. We are now ready to start to write our Cordova code to access the features of a device. And so basically, um, we're going to be able to write navigator.vibrate or uh, camera.capture. We're going to be able to write this code, this JavaScript code, which Cordova will translate to the appropriate language, to the appropriate platform. But all of that code must be inside of the onDeviceReady function. It's going to get you know, 700 lines long. Let's do a save all. And let's go to view error list. Visual Studio has a, a code checker built in, which would have been amazing last month for a lot of us. But here now, if you go to View, Error List, get this panel with errors, warnings, and messages. If something is an error, the app will just not run at all. If there's a warning, the app will run, but there might be some bugs or something. And messages, it's some sort of message. Notice at the moment, errors is turned on, it's highlighted. Warnings is turned on, it's highlighted. Messages, in my case, was not turned on, but there were no messages. And at the moment, I turned off warnings, but it says there's uh, you know 0 of 9 being shown. <coughs> I turned that on. Uh, this is the this is the um, Visual Studio Code checker being very strict. Remember when we had when we had used strict, so it's checking and finding a variety of warnings, and it tells you in which files in your CSS file there's something in the index.html there might be something in the JavaScript there might be something. Um, Let's fix these issues just so that we have no issues at all. And notice if we stretch it out there, it says that in your index CSS file, it says universal selector, selector asterisk is known to be slow. So it says if you're using on your line one uh, asterisk webkit tap highlight color, it could slow down your app because that asterisk means apply this to every single element that exists in your project. Every single paragraph, every single div, every single h1, every single image. So it would make sense. This is going to add, this is going to make the highlight color invisible everywhere. 
you can decide based on testing your app and such if you want if that matters or not. I'm going to leave it for the moment, but the way to fix that warning is to delete that. And then you save it, and then, OK, no, no more warning. But I don't want to do that. So you could do that. When you make these changes and you click Save, these things will update. The property MS text size adjust is compatible with WebKit text size adjust and should be included as well. If you double click any of these, it'll jump you to the line as well. So again, as we get more complex with our project, especially JavaScript, we want to look at the error list before we try to deploy because we might have errors and then waste our time deploying to the device and whoops, there were errors. We want to get used to looking at view error list in part two of the class. And then we can double click to go jump to a specific file and line. So what this one is telling us is we have WebKit text size adjust, and it's recommending we also use dash ms text size adjust. So I say, OK, great. In line 8, I'm going to add dash ms dash text size adjust, colon none. Notice as you type these, it pops up to tell you what are valid values. And you can use the arrow keys to move up and down, select what you want, and then press Tab. It'll type it for you. I type that. I save that. That fixed one issue. The property Mo's user select is compatible with WebKit user select. Uh, so I go to that line. I add that little bit of code. So this is creating platform-specific code. WebKit is basically the rendering engine is basically Android and iOS. So there's code targeting those two platforms. And since this is in CSS, you know, you can write a comment here. WebKit equals Android iOS. MS equals Microsoft. It's saying Mo's user select none. Mo's is Mozilla. Did you know that for a time, the Mozilla organization, the ones behind Firefox, did you know for a time they had their own operating system? They were trying to make their own version. They were trying to make like an Android operating system. Uh, and uh, you could get a phone with Firefox OS instead of Android. Uh, it didn't quite work out. Um, it was a cool experiment, but it didn't quite work out. But here for compatibility, we're adding that as well. And then the property MS user select is compatible. Okay, so I, uh, there's WebKit user select, Mo's user select, MS user select. So for each of the platforms, I'm adding the appropriate code to, to, to deactivate the select feature. Again, think about it. On, on the apps that you use, you don't exactly tap to hold and select something. Like you don't tap and hold a Facebook text and select it. It's it's there in the app. It's locked in there. So that's what we're doing here. Don't let a person tap and hold and select text. We can allow it when we need it in various other ways. But here we're sort of, maybe not the best word, but we're fooling people that this is a real app. It's, it's a real app. It's going to go to the real app stores. But it started off as a web project. Therefore, we have to deactivate some of the features of a web project. And then it says, missing the standard property, user select, none.
and then in my um, HTML file, this one's this one's just gonna always be there. Cordova JS is not found, and like I said, it will not be found. It won't be there when you click Run. It will be created, and this warning will go away. So just ignore that warning because, I, as I said, warnings will allow your app to run, but um, errors will not. And if you're curious, you can actually click on these items on the left and it'll pop up to a really technical document where it'll give you even more documentation about what does that stuff mean. Then we've got some warnings in the index file. Unnecessary semicolon. Unnecessary semicolon. You should see that at the end of the lines of the functions, they have an unnecessary semicolon. We don't need a semicolon at the end of a function. We need it almost everywhere else except at the end of a function. So we delete that one, the other one, and the other one, but not the one at the very end. That one you do need. When you save that, then those go away. What's the question? She was updating the wrong file. She was updating her CSS instead of her JavaScript. No problem. Here you go, right here. Undo. So, so this um, this error list right here should be very useful when when writing our code. We should keep an eye on this screen because it will give you feedback about errors or warnings. These two right here, I'm going to leave them. They're always going to be there, that's fine, but here's, here's one way to fix it also. Turn off warnings. <laughs> Just click the button right there. Turn off warnings. You know, out of sight, out of mind. So save all. We have a button right here, save all. Now that we've edited three files, save all. Run it on your device or browser simulator. And you'll see a very boring looking project, which is OK, because we're going to then bring our project from last month into it next time. We're, uh, we need to do, it's not just drag and drop and such. It takes a moment. So for the moment, I want to see that. For the moment, I want to see that all your files are there and that uh, you've got your project on your flash drive and and all of that. So, uh, Myrie and Ashley, please, a little quieter, please. So, um, I'm running it right here and super boring. I see it says CVDB and that's it, but that's fine. And then the color is, is dark right there. That's fine. But if I go look at my icon, I see my little smiley face that I drew and it says CBDB and I'm on my way. I'm starting to set up this project when we come back on Tuesday we're gonna then add we're gonna we're gonna go integrate what we did last month into this month and as I wind down I'll take questions and then I'll tell you I'll remind you that I will be putting a copy of my code in the network folder also most of the days I'll be putting a copy of my CBDB project with the date. You'll be able to get a copy of it. Um, I'll do that in just a moment. General questions on all that we've covered today? I hope you practice this uh, at home. Uh, guys, Sophia and everyone right there, just a quick moment, please. So let me uh, copy my project into the network folder up to this point and then we'll have some lab time